Hi, everybody. Welcome to our series on the five senses um, as part of our Overthink podcast uh, YouTube channel and audio podcast, which you can find on Apple, Spotify, wherever you listen to the show. I am one of your co-hosts, Dr. Ellie Anderson, professor of philosophy, and we have our other uh, co-host, David. I'm going to give it over to you, David, to introduce our wonderful guest who's joining us today. Uh, yes, um, we're very excited to have an expert today on smell who comes from a very unique background. Uh, Renaud Salmon is Chief Experience Officer at Amouage, which is a fragrance house founded in Oman that is seeking to redefine the old Arabian art of perfumery. And he has worked previously as the vice president of Marc Jacobs Fragrances, as well as at um, major venues and um, fragrance producers um, and fashion, uh, recognizable fashion names like uh, Louis Vuitton and Delvaux. He is an expert on luxury perfumes, and we are very happy to have him with us today. He's joining us all the way from Muscat, Oman. And uh, Renaud, uh, welcome uh, to Overthink. Welcome. Thank you very much. Welcome. Well, hello, everyone. And uh, hello all the way from Muscat in Oman. Well, we're, as, as we mentioned, we're super excited to have you with us because one of the big questions that we want to answer in this series is how do people from very different perspectives and fields think about different sensory modalities? In this case, we're going to be focusing on smell. And so, so having with us an expert on perfume, um, it seems like a perfect fit for the kind of project that we want to create. So um, again, thank you for collaborating with us. And so let's just jump right in into thinking about the relationship between fragrance, perfume, smell, um, and uh, your worldview around uh, um, this particular sense. So smells, of course, are extremely powerful experiences that shape our lives from the very moment that we are born. And one of the problems that I've noticed in a lot of writing about smell, both the art of smell, the philosophy of smell, um, as well as the science of smell, is that our natural languages like English, uh, Chinese, Spanish, um, they're, they're notoriously bad at capturing the, the power and the diversity of smells. So for example, in English, we have very few words to actually describe smells, um, especially when you think about how many words we have for visual phenomena uh, or even for uh, hearing. And I suspect that French might be similar in that way, since um, I, I believe that may be your uh, native tongue. Um, and, and so I, I want to ask a question about language, because part of your job as an expert on, on perfumes is to talk about smells and to capture the power of particular fragrances and perfumes in language. So how do you, in your practice, go about overcoming this limitation that is built into our natural languages? How do you cultivate the art of talking about smell, which some people have described as the sense without words? Yeah, this is, this is a very good, actually, um, very good question. Um, because in a way, um, I, I might slightly disagree, actually, with, you know, the statement that, that you know, there, there is no language. I think there is one, the, the one of perfumers that tends to be quite technical. Um, so, so it's, it's a language that we use, uh, when, you know, when I interact with perfumers and so on, and, and, and we use, um, a very technical terminology, but that is quite precise when it comes to actually evaluating, you know, what we smell. Uh, and I, and I, and I would use that language to be as precise as possible so that they can understand actually you know, what I'm perceiving and where I would like the fragrance to, to move. Um, however, that language would be totally um, misunderstood or by, by people. And ultimately, in my job, I'm sitting between perfumers, working with them, giving them creative directions and so on, and then my clients. So, you know, people who are wearing my fragrances every day. Um, and I need to find a way 
to have those two worlds actually talk to each other. So um, the, the, the way I go around this, I think, is in my everyday job, I'm trying to translate what I smell and what I perceive and so on into, into words um, using most of the time analogies or using, um, you know, using synesthesia actually as a way to, 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 to bring to life the, 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 the complexity of smell. So let me give you an example. An aquatic fragrance, I could tell you blue. You know, you, your brain would be closer to actually you know what what an aquatic smell is um no no you know again the perfumer would say well it's not any aquatic type of scent it's a cologne type of scent which is actually it's melony aquatic um it's blue but light blue and so what i'm doing i'm, I'm using many analogies i'm painting in a way with my words i'm, I'm painting a picture of what some, something smells like. So in a way, I think it's really about using, uh, using words to, to, to paint a description that is as detailed as possible, but at the same time, as simple as possible for people to understand. Mm -hmm. And uh, can I ask a follow-up about this? Because I find that really fascinating that you find yourself um, in between as the bridge between this highly technical, maybe um, uh, reified scientific language about smell, which I, sus I suspect is the language of chemistry, right? You're talking about perfumers talking about molecules and particular compounds uh, mm -hmm. that make up the, the actual fragrance. And then on the other hand, this more creative way of using language to evoke an experience uh, to create a scene. Um, and and uh, I, I like the idea that you are connecting the two. And I'm wondering whether in your in in your work as as this bridge you also try to bring those languages together rather than just navigating the difference between them so do you bring the creative side to to the chemists working in the lab and do you also bring the chemical language sometimes you know to to the clients like me or ellie more ellie since uh she's the between the two of us she's the expert on on perfumes yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, what was that Am I the expert on perfume? Where did that between come? the two of us, between the two of us, I mean, not between the three of us, between the three of us, uh, Renaud is the expert on perfumes. So I'm just wondering whether it cuts both ways, whether you bring yeah. the creativity into the science and the science into the creativity as well. Yes, um, and and uh, in a way, I think there has been a trend um, quite recently, actually, uh, of using a more technical terminology with clients as much as possible in, in the spirit of, you know, education and credibility and so on. So sometimes actually saying, you know what, actually frankincense as, you know, a terpenic facet and, 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 um, terpenic is a word that would not be understood usually by, by clients and so on. However, if I, if I use that terminology in, um, communication in videos and so on, and all of that, particularly as I'm creating for a prestigious friend's house, that's supposed to be, you know, um, I'm really obsessed about the, the, the quality of all of our ingredients and, and, and all of that. I think it, it, even if the word is not understood for the first time, then at least it gives a lot of credibility to the, you know, to, to the message that, that I'm giving. Um, and then it's all about explaining that terpenic, you know, is, um, is actually something that smells slightly camphorous, slightly, uh, like a pine tree, slightly. And then that's when you start actually mm -hmm. explaining, you know, a terminology, um, that, that is progressively be, that is progressively understood more and more by the clients, particularly. Um, you know, a little bit, I would say the, the deeds of perfumery and so on. So people who talk about fragrances every day and so on, create content, create videos, and then progressively it gets actually translated into simpler words. And, and ultimately you would go into a perfumery and most of the time people would not use terpenic, but they would say, oh, it smells a bit like a sauna or something like that, you know? So, so I think th th this is a way, um, uh, in which the, you know, a bit of a more complex terminology is, is, is being brought into a, 
you know, the life of clients. And the other way around, I think that's one way to provide um, very clear and spontaneous feedback to, um, to perfumers, for example, is actually by just like being very blunt and, 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 and natural about it. And sometimes actually, you're not trying a bit too hard to use the exact terminology and so on, um, can limit the impact of, of what you are trying to achieve. Mm. And sometimes I go to a perfumer and I say, Hey, I would love it to feel like that, you know, that cotton candy that I had when I was 10 years old, um, with my mother. Uh, and we were like looking at everyone, you know, having fun on, the, uh, uh, on this, on this giant wheel, instead of saying, Hey, I would like the smell of Petit Maltol because that's what I'm after. But you know, um, so in the end, sometimes I, I believe that going that way, being quite regressive in a way in your terminology and, and, and being quite simplistic can have also a big impact on what you're trying to achieve, particularly with people who are, um, you know, quite used to, to some kind of terminology. So in a way it, it creates a bit of a shock. Um, and I, I mean, it can be really impactful. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, as I'm hearing you talk about the language of, of perfume too, I'm thinking about the people who are buying it and then wearing it. And, and that seems to be, that that likely changes the scent as well, right? I've definitely had the experience of thinking that something smells wonderful in the store and it, like hearing all of the notes that it has and stuff. And then I put it on and 30 minutes later, it just smells like powder. Like it just smells bad. <laughs> and so I also think there's perhaps a sense of, I don't know, I, I don't know how you kind of gear your art towards this, but thinking about how people are going to wear it and how it's going to interact with the chemistry as well. It's not just the scent that you create. It's also the scent that, that people are going to wear that's interacting with, with their bodies. Definitely. And, and I mean, this is something, um, I think this is something extremely important to realize that the perception of scent is not only your nose. So, I mean, that, that, that. I mean, that might seem obvious when I, when I mention it, but, um, if I may, I would, I'd love to tell you about a little experiment that, um, we do, uh, in perfumery school. So, um, yeah, yeah. Hit yeah. us. We want to hear about it. <laughs> so you would go to, uh, one of your first days of, um, you know, in the perfumery training, um, and, 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 the, the trainer would tell you, um, look at this, um, I don't know. Let's take one. Like, okay. He would show you three bottles like this, you know? Um, and, um, so you would have, uh, one bottle that is yellow and that has a yellow fragrance inside one bottle that has a green fragrance inside one bottle that has a blue fragrance inside. Um, and the trainer would tell you one fragrance, uh, smells like pine tree. One fragrance smells like lemon and one fragrance smells like the sea. Okay. So, so you start smelling and you obviously think there is a trick, you know, probably the, um, the green one is not the pine tree one. It's, you know, they're trying to trick my brain and some, <laughs> but I'm going to smell. And then ultimately you smell the three of them and you come to the conclusion that the yellow one actually has like very like tiny lemon notes that you do smell and, and the green one has pine notes and then the blue, the blue one has a little bit of this marine kind of uh, feel. So, so you say, I, I mean, I think it's quite obvious, but this is what it is. And the, the reality is that the, the, those fragrances are exactly the same. The three of them are exactly the same. Um, and at first you don't believe it, but but they are exactly the same. And, and the difference is that your brain was conditioned just by the use of those words and those colors and so on, you know, to be a bit more receptive, but slightly more receptive to, you know, the lemony notes, the pine notes and the water notes. And, and it shows actually the importance that, um, you know, colors, words, uh, materials and so on have on your perception of smell. 
Um, so, so for me, that was quite, um, you know, eye opening because I was always believing that, well, it's all about the nose, you know, and it's only your nose, uh, in the end, you know, smell, you smell with your nose, but today I would say that you don't smell only with your nose. Um, you know, you just smell with all of your senses in a way. Yeah. Well, and this leads me to, uh, to a question that I've been thinking about in preparation for this interview, which is how and whether odor can be the basis of an art form, because I think it's common to describe perfumery as the art form of smell. Um, but philosophers in our tradition have sometimes been skeptical of the idea that odor can give rise to an art form at all. Um, so for instance, notoriously, Immanuel Kant made the argument that odors can't be the basis for genuine art because they're too diffuse, unstructured, and related to subjectivity. There can be visual art for him, because you can see a painting, right? Or um, sonorous art like music, but no olfactory art. Um, what are your views on this? Do you see perfumery as an art, a science, a chemistry, a fashion, or maybe something else even? Yeah, I definitely think that perfumery is many things. Uh, it's a business, it's, it's art, um, it's, it's a hobby. I think it's, it, it, it can be considered in, in, in many ways. Now, you know, probably in my opinion, what makes it a little bit blurry is the fact that it's very intangible, you know, and, and it's probably one of the senses that, that people are the least at, at ease with. Mm, um, yeah, yeah. you know, I think you, you really. Usually, you know, people do trust their eyes, like, oh, I trust what I see. Like, I know that I, I really trust what I've, what I've seen and, and I don't question it or I don't doubt it. Um, I trust what I touch. You know, you would not question that. But, but then I think people are probably a bit less at ease with, uh, with their nose. And, and, and it, you know, so, so as a consequence, um, it feels a little bit more subjective, as, as you mentioned. Um, it feels a little bit, um, I don't know, more vague. And it's also, in a way, more abstract. And some, But for me, by definition, I mean, those are qualities of, like, you know, um, that you find in art and, and so on. So for me, I don't see why sun. And, and perfumery could not be considered um, a form of art. No, it's every day, you know, it's, it's an everyday perfume, a piece of art. I think this is another story, you know, and, yeah. and, and, and that we can debate about it and so on. Like, you know, the perfume that you are going to, to buy in a shop, like, can it be considered a piece of art or is, just, is it just like, um, you know, a product like another one? Yeah. That's a different story. Yeah, I, I find it interesting that there is this tension between the intangibility of odors and smells and fragrances, which makes them more abstract, and then that makes us worry that it cannot be the basis of art. But at the same time, a lot of philosophers of art tend to value abstraction and intangibility um, and in art, not always, but, but often. So it seems like there is some other bias or prejudice at work here. And, and I wonder whether it's what Ellie mentioned earlier, which is the fact that perfume is worn on the body. Um, and so in the eyes of people, it might be closer to fashion uh, that you, and because of the connection to business and commerce as well, which uh, you alluded to, uh, Renaud, uh, that I, I wonder whether that is a, a strong prejudice that people have that because it's worn, it cannot be art because it's not this object that is out there um, for a clear intersubjective judgment on which we can all agree even though we can't really do that with other art anyways. Well, and that it's worn, but that it's intangible, going back to, to the yeah. previous point too, right? As opposed to fashion, which is worn, but, but visible. Well, and I mean, that it changes, right? Like you mentioned, Ellie, that your perfume at the store, like yeah. it, it evolves. And so I think that adds to the sense of unease um, yeah. and to, to the limitations of language, right? Because whatever way you would have described that particular scent or that aroma, uh, the moment you opened it, then would itself have to evolve with the evolution of of the fragrance itself? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, many other art forms don't evolve. They don't have that quite same temporal dimension. 
other yeah. than music. Of course, music also unfolds in time. Totally. Uh, and just to quickly piggyback on that, this idea that I, I was saying that, you, you know, you originally said, Renaud, that it's intangible, which David, you picked up on. Then I just said it's also invisible. And I'm realizing in those phrasings, we're already expecting smell to conform to the language of other yeah. senses, right? Because intangible means you can't touch it. Invisible means you can't see it. And so th I think that also shows this hierarchy whereby smell gets, you know, subordinated relative to the other senses. Yeah, I, David, I, what was I, your I, original question? I, we, I went off in a different direction there, but maybe you have a response I, to that, Renora. We can ask David what you <laughs> um, and So, I mean, I actually had a very different question. So we got a little derailed here uh, in connection so what to are, whether are you are, are, are Did you want to respond to that or are you good to move on? We just... <laughs> No, I, I think I'm good to move on. But I, yeah, I mean, uh, I think it's a very interesting discussion. And, and, and I was recently thinking about creating actually um, fragrances with an approach that, you know, that relates to a specific type of art movement uh, and, and particularly um, surrealism, for example. So, you know, like think about it, like, you know, surrealism, you can imagine a painting. Uh, what about a fragrance that would be created following a surrealistic approach? Um, and, and in a way, because mm -hmm. I was thinking about that approach and thought it probably shows that, I don't know, I mean, it, 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 it can be considered as, a, as an art form because you can also apply, you know, art like approaches and so on to it in a way. Can can we have a Dada fragrance? I'll take the Duchel Fountain fragrance, please. <laughs> I'll take the brutalist architecture uh, smell. I, I want some steel and concrete. Uh, but you see, that's, that's a good one, I think. You, you said brutalist. You know, we all see architecture and so on. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, for me, it's quite obvious that, the, you know, the translation of brutalism into scent would be, um, you know, a fragrance with, strong blocks of ingredients instead mm. of something, you know, that blends very oh, nicely right. together and so on. And hmm. you would have like, uh, I don't know, something, imagine fragrance notes that are quite cubical and so on. So like with sharp edges, um, as you said, like metallic or like the smell of concrete. And so you kind of translate, you know, all of your like um, associations to, to sun and it does work quite well. And, and that could become a brief actually for a perfumer to create um, a fragrance inspired by, by brutalism. And, and I mean, it must have been done. Huh. This is our next collaboration. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, but I think that's really uh, fascinating because it shows how the approach to smell can be so plastic that it can adapt to different historical art movements. And so that that's one way of thinking about it historically. And the question that I was going to ask originally is similar, but instead of thinking about it across historical periods, it, it's about geographical areas. So thinking mm -hmm. about the diversity of smell um, globally. And the reason that I, I'm thinking about this is because uh, you work for Amouage and uh, that fragrance house specifically claims to want to develop and cultivate and maybe perfect, I don't know if that's the right word or not, the Arabian art of perfumery. And so when I think about the other senses, uh, we very easily recognize cultural variation in the sensations and phenomena that are privileged, you know, with, with sound, there are different musical traditions in different areas. With taste, there are different cuisines that favor different flavor profiles. And so I'm curious about cultural and regional differences in smell profiles. So can you talk to us about what the, what a uniquely Arabian approach mm -hmm. to smell means to you? Okay. That's a good one. And, and so there are probably like two aspects. One is like, um, you know, a, a, a explaining the fact that definitely there are some, um, differences when it comes to fragrance profiles and preferences of people around the world and so on. And, and, and then the second one is actually what is, um, you know, Arabic style in perfumery and particularly, uh, I would say Omani style because it's, it's 
some more subdivision of Arabic and Amouraj is from Oman. And, and I think Oman is a very spe specific style. So, um, the, the, the first one is, um, um, I think they have some scent profiles in perfumeries that in perfumery that are quite universal. Um, if you take, for example, the smell of vanilla, I think vanilla is universally liked and universally, um, associated with more or less the same feeling, you know, of like comfort and, uh, it's really comforting. It's, it's, I don't know, you relate that to your mother, you relate that to, um, to peace and, and all of that. So I have not seen, you know, many differences from that point of view, but, um, to give another example, rose, um, the, the rose in, um, you know, if you live in the U S you probably associate rose with women's fragrances. Well, it's not the case at all, um, in, um, you know, in the Arabic, uh, peninsula. Uh, so I mean, men wear rose based fragrances every day. Um, and it's the same with Jasmine in, in, in India and so on. So, um, they, they have a few. Um, a few of those, um, and then, um, I don't know, um, you also have citruses and lavender that are considered precious and beautiful ingredients in Europe, um, that are perceived as quite functional in, um, the GCC region because they are associated with floor cleaning, cleaning products, for example, and so on. So, uh, it shows, um, definitely the differences. And I think, you know, that's why. Um, I'm, right now I'm questioning actually, you know, the, 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 the idea of, um, giving genders to fragrances, uh, and, and, and it's something you might have seen, you know, like today there are more and more genderless fragrances. We don't say it's for men and women and so on. And you might think, oh, it's, you know, marketing technique or something like that. But it's, I, I genuinely feel that actually, I mean, who am I to say that this is only to be worn by men and women? So. I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely, I think, questioning that. And if you think about it, the, the, you know, giving genders to fragrances is, is something that appeared quite recently in the history of perfumery. So, so this is one. And then the second one, when it comes to the um, Arabic style of perfumery, I think you can easily see the analogy with, you know, the, the, the culture in general. So the Arabic style of perfumery is quite generous. Um, it's quite rich, quite opulent. Um, they are quite, um, long lasting potent fragrances in general. And then when it comes to, um, the Omani style specifically, um, you know, people in Oman love, um, generosity. They are very generous. They love actually, you know, the, the rich beauty of nature and so on. But that I think that taste is very, very refined, you know, and they are not that show off and so on. It's not about, you know, having things that are, I don't know, bling bling that shine and so on. They have a very, they love actually, you know, very refined art, um, and, uh, they love nuances and complexity. And that translates actually into, uh, the Omani style of perfumery, which is very generous, very rich and potent. But this is done through nuances and complexity. Uh, that's what it is. Um, I th there's like so many, so many possible things I, I could ask. I have so, so many questions for you. Um, but I think, you know, one, uh, one thing that so many people associate with sense is the link to memory. And so since we have time for just one more question, I can't not ask you about memory. Um, because I, I mean, I recall, for instance, when I was in middle school, having a d deciding that I wanted or no, not middle school, it was it was much later. It was in high school deciding that I wanted a catalog of my fragrances from middle school on to remind me of the time and actually one of, I think the first perfume I ever bought was a Marc Jacobs perfume, if I'm recalling correctly. And so I wanted to, I probably saved up my babysitting money or something. And I wanted to <laughs> save all of those scents. <laughs> and then randomly, my dad threw them all away when I was in college, because it just looked like a collection of old bottles in a drawer. In any case, 
Um, the point being that for me as a teenager, as well as for many of us throughout our lives, scent helps fix memory and also reminds us of times past. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the connection between perfume and smell and memory? Oh, it, yeah, I, I mean, in a way, I, I, as you, as you said, it just, it just feels like it acts like a, you know, like a fixative of a moment in time. Um, and it's, it's an additional element that, that goes, you know, like deep in your brain and so on. And, and usually, um, I don't know if it ever happened to you, but you know, you, you, you would smell something and you would directly think, oh, I know this smell, like I, but, but, but it's not only about the smell. What you are trying to find is the situation, um, where, and when you experience that smell, mm -hmm. like, Hey, I, I know the smell that was like when, when I was, I don't know, like when I was doing this, like when I was, um, in this place, uh, it's the smell of this city. It's the smell of. And, 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 and this is a super interesting topic, you know, because when you ask people about, Hey, what's the smell of this city? They would, they would tell you, Oh, it's the smell of, I don't know, the, the, the hot dogs, you know, like I, I lived in New York. Um, and for me, the smell of New York is actually the smell of those smoky cars doing hot dogs on the streets. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it has nothing to do with the real smell of, I mean, of the buildings of New York or something like that, but because it's, 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 it's such a specific scent profile that I, for some reason, you know, never smelled before, but every, every morning I was passing in front of that, that little truck and I was smelling it and so on. And now it's in my, it's in my brain. So, um, I, I. And, and, and that makes memory stronger. Now, when I, when I think about those days in New York and so on, I'm, I, 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 I can really paint that, that picture in my head of that time and, and the smell is linked to it. So, um, yeah, I, 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 I don't know. I mean, you might have scientists explaining that and so on, you know, in, in, um, it during your thoughts, but I, I, I think it's extremely strong. Yeah. And part of what and I, I imagine know. makes your job so rewarding to, to have, you know, people associate your sense with such important and personal feelings. Yeah, definitely. And it, yeah. and it makes me now think about the work of perfumery. I mean, this is drawing a very broad connection, so I would have to be a little bit more nuanced here. Um, and, but as a kind of psychological interaction uh, in which you are digging back old memories, um, right? Which is, is something that art can do, but it's also something that other disciplines try to do. So thinking about the relationship between the perfumer and the ultimate consumer of the perfume as engaging in this dance between the present and the past. Mm -hmm. uh, where it's not just about the moment of the creation of the smell or the consumption and the experience of the smell, but the past is always lingering there as the thing that determines the meaning of that interaction. And I think that's really beautiful. Yeah. And now imagine smelling something that you've never smelled before, because this is also an interesting approach, you know, like you talked about the link to memories and some, all of that, but then sometimes you, um, you end up actually, and, and I end up smelling, um, fragrances and I smell them and they smell like nothing I've ever smelled mm -hmm. before. And this is a very weird situation because automatically you, you try to find the comfort zone, you know, you try to, to, to relate a, a scent to a memory or something like that. And then when you smell something completely new that you cannot associate with, with anything, you, you know, I mean, it's, it's. It, it can be a bit scary sometimes and, and, and it shows also, I think it really shows the importance of smell when it comes to, um, feeling protected and, and it goes back to, you know, very basic needs, mm. like feeling safe. Uh, I think 
we probably associate suds with safety a lot, like uh, mm. subconsciously. And, um, and, and smelling a, a, a totally new scent, I mean, is probably associated with fear first, because it's something you don't know. Um, and then it becomes curiosity. You know, it's like, okay, you know, I'm in a safe place and so on. I'm not going to be, to be killed or whatever. And so on. let me, let me, let me get curious about it. Um, and, and it's curiosity and then it's appropriation. Like, okay, I, I, I love it. Like I, I'm, it makes me, it, I connect with it and so on. And, and, and then it becomes a memory and, um, because that's, you know, that, that day when you smell this and, and. And the day after you, you, you remember how you felt the day before and so on and so on. And, and, and usually, you know, I would be working for several years on a fragrance and, and when I would release that fragrance, I would always remember the first time I smelled that very particular accord, um, that, you know, that's stuck in, in, in my head since, since then. Amazing. No, that's wonderful, especially just because of how ancient smell is as a sense. I mean, it predates vision, definitely, even though we privilege vision so much. So from this yeah. deep evolutionary perspective, it is quite elemental and primal in a yeah. way that um, maybe other senses are not in the same way. I totally um, relate to that sense of safety, that idea that I had people staying in my in my house over the summer. And when I got back, I immediately uh, lit my candle to to get my scent back in the home because it's not like the, they smelled bad or anything. It was just like it smelled different <laughs> from when I lived there, you know. And so it was just that sense of I need to recultivate my relation to my home. The first thing I did was was light a candle. Yeah. Uh, well, um, Renaud, I think we have uh, bypassed the time that you allotted us already. So thank you for your generosity. I could talk to you for hours. <laughs> Yes, there, there are so many questions here about memory, imagination, sensation, perception, and we only touched the surface. Yeah. Um, but it's been a pleasure um, having you with us today. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, when, thank you. We only smelled the first note, perhaps, David. We'll, we'll <laughs> stick to the sensory modality. We're so grateful for your incredible expertise. We are eagerly awaiting the brutalist scent. Let us know when, when you come out with it. I'll let you know. Well, thanks a lot. I really enjoyed it. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely a passion of mine. So, uh, I hope that, uh, you know, that, uh, that people are going to enjoy it as well. Yeah, I'm sure they will. All right. Take care.